Welcome to Crass and Chaos. Today we have a very special guest, 2024 Republican presidential candidate, Vivek Ramaswamy. Uh, so before we get started, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. It's good to be on, guys. Good to talk to you. So before we get started, like I said, can you tell us, are you a nominee for Speaker of the House? <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I, I'll, uh, that's not a position for me. I <laughs> okay. wouldn't, uh, no, I, wouldn't... I, I have to say that regardless of whether we agree with you politically on some of the issues, uh, I have to give you a lot of credit. You're the first Republican candidate to actually come on our show. So you have more guts than anybody else. My philosophy is talk to everybody. You know, we want to lead this country. I'm not fit to sit across the table from Xi Jinping if I'm not going to sit across from my fellow Americans, regardless of you know, left, right, black, white, it doesn't matter. So thanks for saying that. And, you know, I like to try to practice what we preach. Yeah, I actually saw you had an interview with Alex Jones, I guess it was yesterday yeah. or something. And I, I agree with you. I think freedom of speech, I think the right for people to speak is super important in this country. And I, I think my views kind of changed over time in that regard. And I, I love the fact that you believe that as well. But we do have a lot to talk to you about. Uh, we're going to ask you some things about the Republican primaries, of course, uh, your thoughts on AI, cryptocurrency, and other technology in general. Cool. But first, uh, we'd love to just hear you introduce yourself. Who is Vivek Ramaswamy? Sure, yeah. So my parents came to this country as immigrants 40 years ago with not a lot of money in their pocket. And I grew up in Southwest Ohio. My father was an engineer at the GE plant in Evendale, Ohio. My mom was a geriatric psychiatrist in nursing homes. My brother and I both grew up there. I went to Harvard for college, ended up getting my first job in New York City on the eve of the 08 financial crisis at a hedge fund, which was an educational time, certainly, and you know, began to inform some of the views that eventually became my views today. Went to law school along the way, but started a biotech company, which is really where I had my first major you know, large-scale business success. I built a biotech business that I led as CEO for seven years. Five of the medicines that I worked on are FDA approved products today. That's a multi-billion dollar company called Royvent. I've started several other companies, perhaps most notably among the other companies is a business called Strive that competes directly with the likes of BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard in the index fund space, but specifically with a different vision of proxy voting and shareholder engagement that tells companies to focus on their products, their products and services for profit without orthogonal social goals like environmental or social agendas impeding that. And that was my world. I uh, was an author for some of that along the way. I've written three books in the last few years, which frankly for me, there's no better way of discovering really where my true convictions are than through writing. And so I, uh, I wrote those books sharing my convictions, but in the process, affirming and rediscovering some of them as well. So now you date back to the first book and you look, you know, and even the second one, I don't even necessarily stand by 100% of the things that are in there, probably 95%. But I think that's part of being a human being is that you're challenged with your ideas and you evolve them. And so that's yeah, been my I, journey I, over the last several years, you know, before running for president and decided, you know, at the start of this year to embark on the ultimate way of having an impact on this country right now, I believe, is leading a national revival and reviving our national identity, which is what this campaign is all about. Yeah, there's no doubt that it's a strength to be able to evolve, uh, change your views, kind of adapt. So the so props to that. Um, so I'm going to start off with a question that you probably aren't going to be particularly happy to answer, but That's okay. uh, I, I think a lot of Democrats kind of view you sort of as the nice Trump. Uh, so like, what would you say differentiates you from the former president? And if you had to criticize him in one way, what, what would that criticism be? I think they'd go together with the contrast that I would draw. I'm from a different generation of leadership. I'm young. I'm 38 years old. I have fresh legs. I think that that's a big advantage when you think about uniting this country, reaching the next generation of Americans. You know, I mean, are there some areas where I differ a little bit on policy? Yeah, but, you know, 90, 95 percent of policy areas with the America First agenda, I'm in alignment with those policies. But I think I'm going to be able to unite this country and better able to reach particularly the next generation of Americans, in part because I am a member of the next generation of Americans. And 
that's a precondition for reviving this country. I think young people, frankly, all people in this country right now, all generations, we're lost. We're hungry for purpose and meaning. And I see a deficit in the Republican Party overall. That's what drew me into this race of actually running to something, an affirmative vision of what it means to be an American. I think I'm able to do that, especially for the next generation in a way that nobody else in this race can, and that's why I'm in it. So, so uh, I, I would just say, so your criticism would probably be that maybe he doesn't unite the country as well as maybe he should. Would that be accurate? Well, I, I think part of that is a generational difference in politics too. So I think that, I think that I'm coming from a new generation. And I think that that's what it's, I think that's the contrast is I would say a generational difference in being able to, yes, unite the country by bringing the next generation in. And in some ways, starting with a clean slate, I think a lot of politicians were failing to reach the next generation. You're working within the historical barriers, the echo chambers of partisan politics as they have always existed. But I think if you're able to reach the next generation, as I think we are in this campaign, you're able to start with a blank slate. And yes, I think I can do that in a way that Trump can't. I, I think that's an interesting answer. I let, Let's say that tomorrow you lose, you figure out you're not going to win the primaries. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but let's just say it does. And Donald Trump comes to you and says, you know what, Vivek, be my running mate. What's your answer? So I'm not a plan B person. And, and I know that sounds, must sound like a cop-out answer, but I just want to be very frank. I've said in the past that I'm not running in this to be vice president. I stand by that. I'm running to be the president, but I'm not wired as a plan B person. So I didn't achieve the things that I have by setting goals that then waver over time. So I'm probably like the least well-equipped person to answer a question about, say tomorrow, the goal that you've set out to achieve doesn't get achieved. One of the things I've learned in my life is that your plans are stupid in a certain sense. If you make these nested plans, you know, that's, that's all about your own self-centric view. My view is I'm doing this for purpose. I'm doing it to revive this country. I'm not going to be able to unite this country or lead this country as I would from the presidency, from any other role. So that's what I'm focused on. My gut instinct is we're actually going to achieve it. I know that if you look at the current poll numbers, any of the other candidates compared to Trump, it would look like a daunting challenge. But the reality is there's only two America first candidates in this race and in the Republican Party. So, so are you Trump the backup plan? Like, do you, do you see yourself as like if something happens to Trump? I, I know Alex Jones kind of said this in your interview with him. He said, you know, I, I'm supporting Trump. But if something happens to Trump, you're my favorite. Is that the way you see yourself as? I don't want like... something to happen to Trump. I think that the way that the elections should be decided in this country is the people deciding through the front door, not the legal system or otherwise intervening. Here's how I see it. I look myself in the mirror and ask myself, and this was you know, probably starting in 2020 when I was decided that you know my business career, that was my sole focus before then. I stepped down from my job as a CEO at the start of 2021, at the end of 2020, to focus on a new chapter to say, how am I gonna have an impact on this country? And at every step I've looked at how I can have that maximal impact. Stepped down to become an author, came back as an entrepreneur, starting new businesses, but I think something was missing in terms of the scale of impact I could have on our culture. That's why we made the sacrifice that we did. And it is a, you know, it is, I'm not asking for you know, tears and sympathy by any stretch, but it is a sacrifice. We live a great life. My wife and I were raising our two sons, three years old and a year old in central Ohio. We made a decision last December to say that this was a commitment we were gonna make. We didn't make it lightly. And so my view is I'm running for president because this is the way I'm going to be maximally able to revive our national identity and revive our country. And if it's not this, it's going to be whatever way allows me to maximally have a positive impact on reviving our national identity as Americans. So that's what I'll say. But I don't think anything comes close to doing that as the next president. And that's why I continue to believe we have a reasonable path to success. And that's what I'm focused on. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So as people who lean more to the left, Ed and I, uh, there's a few policies that I picked out that that I, I don't exactly agree with. So I, I thought That's I'd fair. bring them up and we could quickly, briefly discuss them. So I, I think, number one, uh, you mentioned birth light, birth, birthright citizenship uh, and that you believe that uh, that if you're born in the United States, that shouldn't automatically give you citizenship. If you're I, if, if, if you're the kid of an illegal Right. In this yes, case. correct. So 
I, I guess my biggest concern would be, say, that 12-year-old child or 13-year-old child who maybe is found to be illegal according to these new rules. And maybe they never even went back to the country they were from. They, they've never been there, that the country their parents are from. They don't know anybody, might not even speak the language. Uh, how, how can you rationalize sending that child back to a country that they don't know? So I want to say a few things about my policies here. One is, let's just talk about the birthright citizenship issue philosophically for a second, and then I'll get to the practical sure. point. Birthright citizenship is, there's a beautiful idea embedded in the 14th Amendment, and that is to say that your national identity in the United States is not based on your genetics or your lineage or your blood stock. It's based on citizenship to a nation that includes multiple different lineages and religions and birth stock. That's a beautiful idea that resonates with me and was consistent with my, I think, positive nationalist vision for the country. We're a nation founded on a set of commitments. One of those commitments is the rule of law, freedom of speech, open debate, meritocracy, the ideals that make us American. That's what it means to be an American is do you espouse those ideals and are you willing to be a citizen pledging allegiance to this nation? Now, against that backdrop, the 14th Amendment, it was never written to apply to somebody who's in this country illegally to say their kid that happens to be born in this geographic space that you automatically mean citizenship. America is not just this geographic space. It is a vision of what this place can be. So I'll give you one example of that. The kid of a Mexican diplomat who's born in this country. Nobody, legal scholar today, judge today, anyone who wrote the 14th Amendment years ago, Nobody believes that that person enjoys birthright citizenship or that their kid enjoys birthright citizenship. So that's not controversial. I don't think you'd disagree with me on that either. So if the kid of a Mexican diplomat who's here, because the 14th Amendment says it's subject to the jurisdiction thereof, and that kid is not, then the kid of an illegal migrant who illegally broke the law coming to this country and then has that kid here, that kid doesn't enjoy birthright citizenship either. So that's where I'm starting from philosophically and from a constitutional and legal perspective. Practically, as U.S. President, I would enforce the law accordingly with that understanding of the Constitution. And I believe the current Supreme Court agrees with me on this. However, I would apply that prospectively. So that rule and that change to birthright citizenship clearly comes after I put that into effect to say that our understanding of birthright citizenship going forward is this. There's you know, well-known concept in the law known as the reliance interest. Okay, If you relied on the government or relied on a counterparty to adopt a certain behavior, that that does have some legal weight in our understanding of the law. So otherwise, you could trace back grandparents, or let's say somebody was a grandparent, they had their kid, the grandparent was illegal, what then? The way I would apply this is we can't litigate, relitigate the past on birthright citizenship. The way we do it is going forward, we will be crystal clear that of the date that I take office, we will say this on day one, I swear an oath to the Constitution my duty is to execute the laws of the United States. And then everybody's on notice that anybody born in that country, any child born of illegal migrants in this country, illegal migrants will not enjoy birthright citizenship from January 20th, 2025 forward after I swear my oath to the Constitution. So that partially addresses what you asked about. Now, on the flip side, I've also said, though, that anybody who is already in this country illegally must be returned to their country of origin. That's any illegal migrant who crossed this country illegally. That's just holding them accountable for the breakage of the rule of law. Not to say that it's their fault or anything else. You could say it's the fault of Biden or an administration that gave them a wink and a nod. But if I'm the US president, I can't look my two sons in the eye and tell them they have to follow the rules if we have a government that doesn't follow its own rules at the southern border either. So yes, are these difficult could, could issues? You, yes, they are. You, that's let's, say your, let's say your son grows up, he's 12 years old. Could you look? his friends, his friend in the eyes and say, sorry, you got to get out because your parents had you here when they were illegal. Like, it, isn't that kind of like a moral obligation to protect that kid as well, though? So I would say that I would have been clear at that point in time that anybody born in this country of illegal migrants does not enjoy birthright citizenship, that we're already crystal clear on those rules of the road. If those are the rules of the road, then somebody is in this country illegally then I think the right answer to follow the rule of law is to return them to their country of origin. I, I visited Eagle Pass, Texas, and there was one man I met. I saw many illegal migrants crossing. One man's here. He's here legally. He's married. His wife is still waiting on the other side of the Rio Grande and the Mexican side of the border 
for entering this country through the legal process, and it's been far delayed. Th that's a spouse. That should be an easy rite of passage, and yet it's taken far longer than it should have legally. She's still waiting there, even though she could be crossing the Rio Grande illegally, yet as tens of thousands per week are otherwise. You're going to talk about issues of fairness. That's, fundamental, that's a fundamental injustice in that situation, that the people who follow the rule of law are the ones who are penalized in favor of those who do not. And so I think the abandonment of the rule of law by our government in some ways has a trickle down effect to our culture. It's part of why we see a violent wave of crime in this country. Again, if people see a government that itself has turned its back on its own rules or its own laws, then I don't think it's reasonable for us to expect the other people in this country to follow the law either. And that's one of the many explanations for why they're not. And so, yes, I understand the difficulties and the challenges of doing this. I also believe the country that put a man on the moon, this is not a technical challenge that we can't overcome. It's a challenge of political will. And then once we have solved this problem of illegal migration and sealed the southern border, and I think the northern border too, then we can quickly move to having a reasonable conversation about getting the bureaucracy out of the way when it comes to the rational form of legal immigration that we should want in this country. But I think we have to go in that order to rebuild trust, and that's the order that I'm going to go in if I'm elected president. All right, so, so let, let's move on a little bit. Another one of your policy ideas is to this idea of moving the voting age up to 25 unless you can pass a civics test. So the Gettysburg Address, it didn't say government of the people by the smart people. Uh, to me, that's it's ageism, and you're targeting these people based on age. Does that mean that we should say you know, if you're over the age of, let's say, 65 or 70, you should take a mental acuity test to make sure that you're not yeah. suffering from dementia or maybe pre-dementia. So, so I'm against ageism, and I understand the nature of that criticism, but let me tell you what my basic worldview is here. I think everybody in the country should have to be able to at least know something about the country, not pass a civics test. It's the same civics test that we require of legal immigrants to this country before they can vote. So right now, if you're an immigrant to this country, you could pay taxes, you could pay millions in taxes, even if you're successful. You can't vote unless you have gone through the naturalization process, which includes knowing some basic things about the country. That is to say, if you're an immigrant to this country, you better darn well know when you're voting for U.S. president what branch of government the U.S. president leads. We as a country have made the determination to say that that's a reasonable thing to require of an immigrant to this country before they cast a ballot. I'm just going one further step in saying that if you graduate from high school and you're gonna go cast a ballot and become a full citizen in the same way as somebody who came to this country as an immigrant, you should know the same thing that an immigrant has to know in order to become a voting citizen of this country. And I respectfully reject the notion that that's a, somehow a intelligenceocracy. A 10-year-old girl approached me in Iowa two weeks ago when I gave a speech there. She had heard about the controversy that this idea had courted. She came to me with a printed out version of the 100, 100 questions in that civics test. 60% is the passing score right now for the immigrants. She scored 100 out of 100. She's a 10-year-old girl. She said she would do it on live TV if she had to, to prove that somebody else hadn't done it. Yeah, but her. all 10-year-olds don't fit into that category. There's also 10-year-olds No, but, but, but I think all 18-year-olds can, and if they don't, then at least they should do, and I've provided a measure for this, some measure of service to the country, six months of military. But, like, but, but I mean, like, what about what about kids who are in, in school districts that are just trash? And, you know, like these kids are we going to, to school. They bear, I mean, yeah, it, it is, I, it is I agree, but I, but I mean, doesn't that need to be fixed before you even think about something like this? I, so that's why I've also I mean, look, I've called for shutting down the Department of Education and giving that 80 billion dollars as a dividend back to the states and to the people to fix this. So in, as a pragmatic matter. I actually would go in that order because the idea about requiring a civic duty component before somebody gains full citizenship, that requires a constitutional amendment. I need not only Congress, but 75% of states across this country. The Department of Education and those fixes start on day one because I run the executive branch of the government. So yes, that's absolutely the order we want to go in, but I'm not restricting myself to a view of what needs to be fixed tomorrow. I'm offering a view that hopefully a vision that thinks on the timescales of history in the United States of America. We need yeah, to revive no, I, civic duty and civic pride in this country. And I don't consider this to be a partisan idea. And I just want to address the point about ageism because I think it's a good question. I would like this to be the case for everybody, but it goes back to that same question I said about birthright citizenship. I would apply that prospectively 
Why? Because there's a reliance interest of people who have relied on a system that came before. I'd say the same thing here, is that if somebody's 50 years old, but they've been doing it one way, you can't yank that out. But I want this to be the new norm going forward to be consistent with some of those basic principles that I apply. The reliance interest applies here too. So even in this conversation, I just want to give you a sense for at least the principles that undergird how I think. It's not that I think this should only apply to young people. I think it should apply to all people, but you've got to start somewhere. And just because you don't have the perfect solution today doesn't mean that you don't get started on the perfect solution today. As it takes time, we're a nation founded on the pursuit of a more perfect union. We're not immediately leaping to perfection, but that's the way I'm going to lead us. And this is consistent with our founding vision where they said you have to have skin in the game to play in the game. You don't value a country, you just passively inherit. And I think some service to that country and the minimum service being that at least you know something about that country, the same basics that we require an immigrant to know in order to become a citizen of this country, I don't think that's too much to ask. I understand that not everyone's gonna agree with me, but that's, I think, what it's gonna take, something outside of the traditional box to revive that sense of civic identity and civic duty in this country. Right. So, so I do want to jump to some tech related questions because sure. most of our viewers are younger people and obviously technology has a significant impact on their future. So, so we spoke with uh, Ro Khanna a few weeks ago about artificial intelligence. We've also spoken to Elon Musk about XAI, his new company. Are you concerned about the safety of AI over the next decade? And if so, what can we do to make sure that AI better aligns with the goals of humanity in general. So I do have concerns about AI. It's a, overbroad to describe it that way because there's many different kinds of AI and applied in many different contexts. So one of the great concerns that I have about AI isn't even about AI, but about an innate human response to AI. I'll tell you what I mean. We'll sort of use a funny example to start with, but it has serious implications. So I'm a tennis fan. I love professional tennis. I used to play tennis growing up. I was a ball boy and a trained line judge for some amount of time, a human line judge, back when I was in my senior year of high school. You call balls in or out. Turns out they don't do it that way anymore. The ball, is, the ball call is made by effectively an AI-based system that doesn't see where the ball lands. It predicts where the ball is going to land, but it does it even more accurately than a camera view would give us. But in the first generation of that technology, a funny thing happened, okay, that John McEnroe's or others of the world professional tennis players, it's a long tradition that you argue with the line judge or the umpire. Well, when the AI started making the calls, even the first generation of it, when you could just see it with your eyes, sometimes and even on a camera replay, it was dead wrong. Something interesting happened, which is the players stopped arguing about it because it was the AI that made the call, which is interesting. So I worry now when you go to chat GPT and you ask, how do you address you know, the challenges of man-made climate change, you get a list of policy prescriptions, or how do you address historical racial inequality or whatever, you get answers that come from the AI that are as though you asked it to convert degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit. I have deep concerns about the human response to AI. This gets to, I think, a broader problem, I think, in modern American life and modernity, which is we are hungry for purpose and meaning. And we're so hungry to bend the knee to the next thing. And so what I'm going to say is going to sound ridiculous, uh, certainly maybe to a young center left audience, but I'm going to say it anyway. And then I'll bring it back and make it sound more sane, I promise. But I think one of the best antidotes to the risks of AI might actually be the revival of faith in America. And, and that's a longer discussion. I don't think that should be enforced by the government or otherwise. But faith, patriotism, family, hard work, the things that used to fill our void and sense of identity, that's probably the best antidote to some of the greatest risks we face from AI. Because the risk with AI often isn't even the AI, AI, it's the human response to it. And part of the human response to it points back to the void of purpose and meaning in our own hearts. That's a deeper philosophical discussion. I'm happy to go there, but I suspect you guys want me to get to some more pragmatic stuff, so which I can go to as well. So when I think about AI policy, I draw some basic principles. First line of defense is the interface between AI and kids. That's, I think, a hard line that I would draw out of the gate. Think about algorithmically powered products or AI powered products. Let's draw some hard lines about what we're going to expose a kid under the age of 12 or under the age of 15 to. That's different from the rules of the road that we might set up for adults. Kids aren't the same as adults. It's a principle I apply across different contexts. I apply it here as well. Now, I don't think we should be adopting any bans in this country that China also isn't adopting. For example, 
We adopted gain-of-function research bans here, totally meaningless if China engages in gain-of-function research that then comes back, boomerangs, and, and affects us here. That's exactly what happened with the origin of the COVID-19 pandemic. But the framework I would use, and this is sort of the punchline that's very pragmatic, is the framework of liability. Okay, so the government's not regulating this, but what we do say is that you bear some level of liability. You could go up and say strict liability included, just as you can't dump your chemicals in somebody else's river. And if you do, you're liable for it as the company who did. You can't metaphorically dump in somebody else's river as well. So if you're the party who created an algorithm or whatever, an AI protocol that has unforeseen, and part of AI is it is an emergent technology. That means it has emergent properties that didn't exist when you first started with it. It's definitionally part of AI. If you have unforeseen consequences, you're still liable for those consequences. So if you're Microsoft or Meta or otherwise, you have to now take that into account ex ante in terms of the consequences of your actions. That's not the framework we have today, but I think that's combined with protecting kids in a liability-based framework basically keeps government to overreach or censorship or bans here versus China, takes that off the table and at least is a positive step forward in internalizing the risk calculus into the people who stand to benefit financially and otherwise from the protocols that they're developing. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. We yeah, can have yeah, it a does. So, so before we close out, I know you have to go. You have, I, you do like 30 interviews a day or something. But, <laughs> do a lot. But uh, uh, just a quick game, a fun game, take about a minute or so to play. Uh, I'm going to give you two things. You're going to pick one, one of the two. Okay, your choice. Uh, Tesla Cybertruck or Ford F-150? Tesla Cybertruck. Uh, Ron DeSantis or Nikki Haley? Neither. <laughs> yeah. right. You copped out on that one. Eminem or Kid Rock? Oh, oh, that's a close call. I think Eminem 1.0 beats Kid Rock. Kid Rock beats Eminem 2.0, which is the reinvented establishment version of Eminem. Yeah, I would, I would say, I'd probably say the opposite, but that, that's cool. Okay. Yeah. okay, Indian food. Achar or butter chicken? Achar. Really? I hate well, I'm vegetarian, so that makes sense. <laughs> that made right, that way finally, last one. But if you Egg went with like a paneer butter masala or something, I would go for that. Oh, yeah, that, that's some good stuff. Yeah. Uh, so Ed Krasenstein or Brian Krasenstein? I feel like I'm going to be very honest. I know both of you by your last name, so um, <laughs> I'm looking at a camera. I'm not, I can't even see your faces right now. So I'm going to have to get to know you guys better, and I promise I will give you an answer. That's been the story of our whole lives. Like yeah. I, I answer to Ed or Brian. He answers to Ed or Brian. So that, that's fair. Anyhow, thanks so much. Uh, we really appreciate the interview. I appreciate you guys having somebody who doesn't agree with you on everything either. We need more of that in this country. And, and that's the only thing I would, I mean, this is what I'm most passionate about. We need more open dialogue in the United States of America. That's how we're gonna actually unite this country. And the best measure of our country's health is, I say this all the time, it's the percentage of people who feel free to actually say what they think in public. Right now, I think we're doing pretty poorly, but I'm, you know, there's other people who have decided to you know, shut me out because they disagree with me. And you know, I think that that's not the way forward for our country. So you know, thanks equally for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again, uh, Vivek. And uh, good luck. Uh, I, I know you've got a busy few months ahead of you, uh, but thanks again. Uh, you definitely, you were the first one of the Republicans to come on our show. Uh, props to you. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Talk to you.